Hi everyone, and welcome back to Genealogy Sucks. I know it's been a couple weeks since we uh, were last face-to-face. -face. Um, after interviewing my grandfather, I was really not sure uh, what I wanted to do, which rabbit hole I wanted to go down. And so it actually took, uh, oddly enough, a Facebook debate that I witnessed um, between family and friends uh, to really inspire me. And so today we're gonna to talk about immigration. I'm gonna warn you, I am not talking about modern immigration. I'm going to attempt to be as unbiased as possible. And I'm also here not to talk about a fucking wall. So if you're here because you saw immigration in the title and you think I'm here to talk about a fucking wall and that's what you want, please leave the chat. We're not doing that, we're learning because I realized that I didn't know as much about immigration as I thought I did. And being a third generation Italian immigrant and being very proud of my heritage, that bothered me. So I wanted to educate myself. And in doing that, I decided I wanted to share what I learned with you guys because I learned a lot of cool stuff and some of it might be helpful to your futures, so. Here's to that. And my grandmother, who you will never meet ever because she hates the internet, um, she has always taught me that you're never too old, too old to learn. Um, <clears throat> she always has been interested in continuing to learn, even from an elementary schooler who called to talk to her about penguins. So you guys can, you guys can do it. Um, first, I'm going to define immigration for you. Um, I didn't know that the definition of immigration was so um, narrow. I thought it was a lot broader than it is. So the actual definition is immigration is the international movement of people to a destination country to which they are not native and do not possess citizenship, seeking to settle or reside there especially as permanent residents or naturalized citizens. So they're not here for a vacation or a hangout. They're here because they want to live here for good. And that is pretty cool to me. Um, I will be reading a story to you guys here at the end that um, will give you a better idea of what some people had to deal with at Ellis Island and um, kind of speaks to the testament of what people are willing to go through for the illusion of a better life because I can only speak for myself, but I don't always think I have the American dream. Certainly not all of you do. Um, I'm sure I live in some kind of dream, but not, not that one, so. But I digress, um, moving on. I'm going to share some history with you and about immigration, which I also learned a lot of stuff um, that I really thought I would have learned in high school or at some point in my life, I didn't take history in my time in college. I didn't complete my degree, but, and I, I do regret that, go to school kids. I don't care if it's a trait, do it. But, um, you know, I thought I would have known more than this. I thought I would have known. I'm disappointed in myself and my teachers. Come on, guys. So I'm going to read out of my trusty, dusty notebook because this is what I do when I'm at work, um, when I'm at the library and have time to um, research. I research because I think education is important. And if you can learn and get shit done. Learn and get shit done, guys. Um, so, before the 1800s, pre-1800s United States, immigration was fairly open. Laws were fairly open. There was some legislation based on um, racial uh, groups immigrating and legislation on them. Uh, specifically Irish and Chinese immigrants. Uh, I'm not going to brought in much further into that, but they were uh, faced with legislation much earlier than 18, uh, 
1776, which is when um, states began passing laws after the Civil War on immigration, and the Supreme Court of the United States decided to step in and say, well guys, we will take care of that, you guys stick to your thing, we will do the immigration part. So they established um, legislation on immigration, and then they established the Bureau of Immigration in 1891 and 95. Um, those are the dates for legislation on that. Um, in 1900, the great wave of immigration began. Uh, much of that came through Ellis Island. Not all necessarily did. I did not pull the numbers on that because Ellis Island is going to be another video. Um, so the great wave began, uh, Preference was focused always pretty much on Northern Europeans. They're believed to be harder workers, smarter, um, more obedient to the law, all kinds of very weird things to me. Um, and so over 24 million people came between 1900 and 1920 to the United States. Um, Four million Italians came between 1800 and 1920. Um, one of whom was my great-grandfather and one of whom was my great-great-grandfather and another was my great-great-grandmother. Um, and so I have, and really more than that. So, you know, I've had, um, probably four, five, six relatives or more come through Ellis Island. So I, I don't have records for all of them, but I'm really mostly going down the route of my great grandfather on my mother's side because to obtain dual citizenship, that's what I have to do. And so um, probably once I start that process with you guys i will start going down other avenues maybe a little bit we'll see um but moving on um in 1921 the national origin quota system was passed uh that was revised in 1924 and that gave all nationalities coming into the united states a quota based on previous u.s census history um italians Serbians, Hungarians, Polish, Irish, French, everybody had to meet a quota. Sometimes that meant breaking up families, which is just heartbreaking um, altogether. But it, it was a reality of the time. It was a reality of Ellis Island era immigration. Um, and the quota system still was favoring the North Europeans because of their perceived intelligence and hard work ethic and things. Um, 1924 also added in the border patrol system. And the uh, quota system, the national origin quota system uh, lasted until 1965. It was recodified in 1952, but it was replaced in 1965. And because this is a two-part video, I'm cutting it off at the 60s because I am it's too much for me and it's too much for any reasonable person and I think most of you watching this is are reasonable some of you might be nuts for watching this I don't know um, but it's too much stuff at once uh, that would suck um, so I will go on in my next video and give you more information about what we replaced the quota system with. Um, I wanted to take a quick moment before I focus my um, time to discuss the attitudes towards immigrants at the time to share this really interesting tidbit that I learned while researching immigration law and the history of immigration in this country. In 1951, we had the Bracero Migrant Labor Program that was an agreement between the U.S. and Mexico made permanent um, and that was seasonal agricultural laborers 
were being sent from Mexico to the United States to replace uh, people who were interested in working agriculture and replace uh, the missing laborers be during wartime, and that was made permanent in 1951. I did not know that that existed, and I thought that was super, super interesting. I know it has nothing to do with Ellis Island. I know it has nothing to do with um, Italians or Italian immigration, and it probably has a little bit to do with a fucking wall, but it is interesting, I thought. So, now I'm going to share with you guys a little bit of um, some of the attitudes that people had towards immigrants during the time uh, between the 1900s and 1950s-ish. Most of my sources are cut off it before the 30s um, or 40s, so it's primarily earlier than that. But um, first, I'm going to start off with a lovely quote from our former president, Woodrow Wilson, who um, had a little bit to say about the type of people that were coming into the country at the time that he was president. Um, this is 1901, and he is quoted as saying, Immigrants poured in as before, but now there come multitudes of men of lowest class from the south of Italy, and men of the meanest sort out of Hungary and Poland, men out of the ranks where there was neither skill nor energy nor initiative of any initiative of quick intelligence, and they came in numbers which increased from year to year, as if the countries of the south of Europe were disburdening themselves of the more sordid and hapless elements of their population. And that is Woodrow Wilson, 1901. Um, that was a interesting thing to find. I um, was actually happy to stumble upon something that was a presidential quote um, and not just a Gallup poll or a article, um, scholarly article or something. And um, I also found in our newspaper archive database that I can access through the public library, um, there was a Gallup poll in 1939. Only 30% of respondents would take in Jewish children um, as refugees to the U.S. And that was in 1939, right on the cusp of when the United States was involving itself in World War II. Um, so I found that really interesting and also very sad. Um, I try to remain unbiased, but I obviously feel for children that had had to be turned away because they were unwelcome because look at, look at what happened. So, um... Moving forward from that Gallup poll, which I think is a necessary addition to the video, um, I wanted to share a little bit of the attitude towards Italian immigrants particularly. And um, there were a reminder, four million of them that came into the United States between 1800 and 1920. Uh, many of them passed through Ellis Island settled on the East Coast. Some of them came to South America, which I actually thought was cool. Um, but the one, the Italians that emigrated to Italy during this generation hailed from more rural and less developed areas of the country and performed more unskilled labor statistically. Um, a reminder, my great-grandfather was a bartender. Um, he also fought in World War I, but he was a bartender. He made um, cheese for Louis Bromfield, which he's a, an American writer. Um, and he made wine for him as well. And um, so, you know, un th that's fairly unskilled labor. I mean, he's not an artisanal cheesemaker an Italian who can make goat cheese. So 
Um, he was just doing what he knew. Um, like the other immigrant groups, uh, Italians faced harsh conditions in their jobs, and when they tried to fight those conditions by joining unions, they found that many unions would not accept foreign-born workers. Um, I don't know the history of the unions that um, my, my grandfather was a member of, but um, he's Italian. I've met many members of that union that are Italian and Irish and Hispanic, so um, obviously things have changed for the better. Um, and just like the Irish and other uh, national nationalities and groups from Europe before them, um, Italians became scapegoats for socioeconomic problems, such as um, job, job difficulty, finding jobs. Um, there were pseudoscientific theories that claimed that their Mediterranean blood made them inferior to the northern Italians and North and Western Europeans, and that it made them more predisposed for domestic radicalism and organized crime. I personally can attest that um, none of my family members that I know of have been a part of organized crime or the Italian mafia. So just putting that out there, that it's not. So, um, and they were also subject to anti-immigrant mobs, organized groups such as the KKK attacking them as well. Um, nearly one million Italian American soldiers served during World War II and many, most of them were uh, recent immigrants or descended from recent immigrants. So first generation, second generation Italian immigrants, um, straight off the boat immigrants fighting for our country uh, in World War II, sometimes against their own brothers, sisters, cousins, uncles, fathers, um, which is similar to our own civil war in ways. So, and so I, um, I'm going to close off with an article. I think I mentioned before, I'm going to link it in the description to the video so that anybody who's interested can read it in full. Um, it's a story of two girls that were sent back from, um, Ellis Island. They were deported. Um, I found this just happened to stumble upon it. The title is Deported um, by Suzanne Langer from February 1st of 1922. Um, the title caught my attention and I read it and it was incredible to learn and it, it really does give a first-hand account of what somebody feels, felt at that time about the immigration um, system. So um, these two young girls from Serbia were sent from New York. They spent time at Ellis Island. They came with their mother and um, they were five children and a mother came to Ellis Island. They were all but two accepted. The two oldest girls, um, Kathy and Anna were sent back to Serbia. Um, they had been Austrian um, until their town of Versac was uh, adopted as a part of Serbia or annexed as a part of Serbia. Um, they had initially been well off until um, the First World War happened and that led them to famine and poverty and they decided to come to America. Um, they took their passports and had them advised by the American Council. 
Mother and five children started upon the great adventure, secure in the power of their passports for what could befall them while those official papers were correct. The first thing that befell was a week of detention on Ellis Island. It was somewhat worse than the steerage trip had been. They waited, not knowing for what. They heard rumors that another paper had been signed and sealed with their fate. Mother and three younger children should enter, but with them the immigration quota was full. Kathy and Anna were to be boarded. Anna was quoted as saying, they kept us two more weeks. It was awful then because there was no hope, nothing to make us bear the filthy, sickly life in those barracks. There were so many of us that, that we almost starved. Every day someone died of disease or broken heart and many women went mad. We can never forget it, not even if we lived a hundred years. It was for that time. It was for that we came across the sea, and now they have signed a paper saying that we must go back to Versailles. Our home is sold, she continued. We have sold our house, our furniture, our mattresses and cloaks, and all of our things. We are told to go home, and there will be no home. We must live on the kind mercy of neighbors. She glanced at her shabby black skirt and blue jacket. A ragged silk kerchief originally crimson and gold and deeply fringed still covered her head it was the only remnant of some gorgeous balkan costume her old mark of rank in yugoslavia and we have no mother she cried suddenly overcome by this great grievance we could bear everything if they only had not taken her away we shall never see her again and we have never been away from her before we are young and helpless and cannot speak to anyone. What will these strange men do to us before we come to Versac? What shall we do among them without our mother? We cannot even write to her because we will never know where she lives and she will not write because she does not believe we shall ever see Versac again. Oh, why did they send us away who are un so unprotected? The author tried to explain to her the necessity of our immigration law and the impossibility of considering individuals among such a multitude of people. Her sister, Kathy, said, is quoted as saying, the law is the law. We know it, but this I will ask the American consul in a later life. Why did he vise our passports at all when it was forbidden to enter? Did he not know how many passports he had already seen and how many could enter every month? The author said or wrote, I could not answer her question. I can only repeat it for myself. Why are these people ever allowed to come? Why are passports approved that can be of no use? Why are heads counted in New York instead of abroad at the, and at the American consulates? Many a human destiny hangs on this little awkwardness of the immigration system. America, that is the promised land at some time to all the oppressed of the world, stands thus in many memories as the gate of sorrows. Poor dreamers, can no one warn them of the fate that may await them? There seems to be absolutely no reason why they should be allowed to sell their all, go to upon the venture perfectly secure in the power of their passports, and return again destitute, penniless, some of them mere children taken from the protection of their parents. They go back to live upon charity, who once have worn handkerchiefs of crimson and gold. What shall the American consuls or we who stand behind their signatures answer these plaintiffs in a later life? That, um, when I read it, left me speechless. Um, so I will leave you all with this new burden of knowledge and um, my next video will be an interview with my beautiful mother. 
I appreciate you all uh, listening, suffering through, through my stutter. Um, and I just thank you for watching. I always am just blown away. So thank you.